Hello, and welcome to a new program here on WUTV that we're calling the Wingate Lecture Series. I'm your host, Dr. Martha Asty, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Wingate University. In this program, we're going to be taking you inside the classrooms of our fine institution to give you an insider's view of some of the most interesting, exciting, and fascinating subjects that are being taught. We hope it'll be a learning experience for all of us. First up is the number one killer in America, heart disease. And a form of heart disease that's the most common is coronary heart disease. What is it and can it be prevented? That's the topic being discussed in Physical Education 101, taught by Associate Professor in the School of Sports Sciences, Dr. John Aquaviva. Today we're actually gonna shift gears. Up until this point, in one way or the other, we have talked about the five components of fitness. Literally up until this point, right? We talked about, uh, I think it was in this order, we talked about cardiorespiratory endurance, we talked about uh, flexibility, we talked about muscular strength, muscular endurance, then we talked about body composition, and we came at that from a few different ways, but primarily we talked about nutrition and how to manage weight and so forth. And it seems like we're making a really big shift talking about the heart and anatomy and so forth. But as we get into this discussion, I think you're going to see this ties directly into everything we've been talking about this semester. Primarily, how exercise and what we eat and how we eat affects this major disease. So this is the organ we're, of course, talking about. I'm going to refer to this diagram here several times throughout this discussion. Um, I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Let's talk about... Let's give an overview first of this whole topic. And let's just simply talk about cardiovascular disease. And from the start, you're going to see why this is such a big deal. This, verse, this very first simple statistic is going to kind of put it in perspective. 50% of all deaths in the U.S. are because of something with the heart. Some type of cardiovascular disease, either directly with the heart or something with the vessels, hence the name cardiovascular. And there's a couple ones that go in there. You guys have probably heard of this, right? Sometimes people have what's called heart failure. Literally, it's, sometimes it happens 80s, 90s, up, up into 100, even 110 years old. The heart just fails. Something goes wrong with it. It's been beating for a long, long time, and it just goes, I can't do this anymore. And then it gives out. Obviously, it's the, uh, it's the primary organ of the body that supplies oxygen to the brain, to the other living tissue in the body. This is one thing. Another one that you guys have probably heard of is what is known as stroke. And this is when, basically, there's a heart attack to the brain. There's lack of blood flow going to the brain. Something happens with an artery that goes to the brain that feeds it oxygen. And of course, this is not only where we think and we have memory, but it controls a lot of organs, including our heart and our respiratory system. So if we can't breathe and the heart doesn't work, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give way, obviously. In fact, it only takes a couple minutes. Stroke is another one. And then we have what's called myocardial infarction. Funny kind of sounding name. Most people don't know myocardial infarction. However, most people do know this. A heart attack. In fact, this makes up the largest percentage of this 50%. So when we're talking about this 50% of all people who die, it's under this category of cardiovascular disease. However, the, by far the largest percentage has to do with this people having a heart attack. And what we're going to do is we're going to come right into exactly why this happens. All right, first of all, let's talk about the heart in general to give it some perspective. It provides oxygen and the other six nutrients that we just got done talking about over the last couple weeks to the brain and to the body. It acts as a pump. And I think even if you didn't pay attention in high school anatomy or biology here at school, you know its primary purpose, right? It's often called the most important organ in the body. And this one on the right-hand side kind of helps explain it. Usually, anatomy and physiology people, they will refer to arteries and veins 
as blue and red indicating blue meaning it's deoxygenated, red meaning it's oxygenated. So let's just think of it in these terms. The muscle, which has used oxygen, will send that blood back to the heart. It's deoxygenated at that point. It's come from the muscle. The muscle goes, I need oxygen to work, literally, every minute. Even if you're just sitting, it takes up oxygen and nutrients. So it comes back to the heart. This is where it's blue. So it goes on the right side. It's on our left, but it's the right side of the heart. And it goes through these chambers and then eventually goes out and goes to the lungs. And there, of course, it picks up oxygen, comes to the other side of the heart, the left side, and then there it pumps it through what's called the aorta, the largest artery, and then it starts to break off. It branches off literally, supplies oxygen and nutrients to the brain, to the rest of the body. Pretty easy concept to understand. It's just simply a pump. Pumps to the lungs, comes back, pumps to the rest of the body, comes back deoxygenated, and goes through this cycle constantly. One of the things, in fact, it's just always an easy round number to remember, it beats around 100,000 times per day does the heart. The reason that it beats goes right back to what we we're talking about, so it can supply oxygen and nutrients to the brain and to the rest of the body. Now this is, even though we can see this, this is one of the more conceptual things that we'll talk about this semester. What the issue is, is not these chambers and inside the heart. It's outside of the heart, this picture on the left. It has to do with what are called coronary arteries. And these guys are really small vessels that supply the heart muscle itself with oxygen and nutrients. So these guys, do just that, supply the heart muscle itself with O2, oxygen, and these nutrients we've been talking about, carbohydrates, or what we call blood glucose, fat, what are called fatty acids, protein, what we call amino acids, and then there's water in there, right? There's minerals, there's vitamins. Now this is where the conceptual part comes in. These arteries are relatively small, as you can see, in fact, most of them are about the size of your lead pencil. So if you have a lead pencil or just the tip of your pen and you look at it, it's really small, right? Not much blood can pass through there. And these guys cover the whole heart. Now this picture that you see on the left, is so, it's an animation, of course, and it's somewhat simplified. And you can even say it's oversimplified in that, that it only shows a couple of coronary arteries. But the fact is they spread throughout the whole heart. And literally, if you were to have x-ray vision, look at somebody's heart, you would see blood rushing through them. And what it does, it feeds the heart itself, so it has oxygen, so it has nutrients, so it can do its job, which is on the right-hand side, and that is pump blood to the rest of the body, right? The percentage of blood that goes to the heart itself has got to be tiny. It's probably less than 1% of overall blood volume. But if the heart itself doesn't get oxygen, doesn't get nutrients, it can't work. This is the heart of our discussion. No pun intended. This is what we're talking about, and that's what we're going to focus on is these coronary arteries. Now, when we talk about these nutrients, remember we're talking about carbohydrates, fats, protein, vitamins, minerals, water, right? That was the last couple of weeks of what we've been talking about. The real problem lies in this. And there's a particular form of fat that is known as cholesterol. In fact, it's this type of fat that obstructs, that starts to build up in these arterial walls, and that's what causes the problem. Now, up until this point, you're probably thinking, all right, I'm grasping pretty much what he's saying. This kind of makes sense. Why is he talking to us about this? I'm 21 years old. Again, I'm going to come back to exactly why I'm talking to college students about it, and you're going to see this would be relevant to even high schoolers. Keep that in the back of your mind. All right, let's talk about these coronary arteries, and in particular, this cholesterol. Okay, let's take this artery and blow it up. Right, so if we were to take one of these arteries that you see here on the outside part, you could literally see these. Remember, they're about as big, maybe a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger, depending on what part of the heart it's feeding to, than the tip of your pencil or your pen. These guys are everything. These guys, everything, and in particular to what we call myocardial infarction or a heart attack. If we were to do a cross-section of this, in other words, 
I were to take this artery, cut it, and then look inside, it would look something like this. I think you guys can grasp that. Now, in a normal, healthy artery, this is normal, or healthy artery, it's open. Blood flows through there, no problems, right? The bottom, of the, part, the bottom of the heart, the sides of the heart, where you can see all these guys branch off. It feeds the heart oxygen and nutrients and just keeps beating, right? But the issue starts when there's some type of obstruction. This cholesterol starts to build up. So, trouble starts to occur in paradise. This is what is known as the first stages of this issue and some cholesterol starts to build up. Now the thing is, is this cholesterol, if you were to literally like remove it from the blood and then, and then um, kind of uh, separate it, it would, it's white and it's a powdery substance. But when it starts to adhere against the wall, it starts to get harder and harder and harder. And this is known as plaque. It's just hardened cholesterol. But you guys can already see why it's a problem because it starts to become hardened and you can see that it may be somewhat difficult to remove. Now, in and of itself, this is not a real big deal because you guys would probably agree with me, there's only maybe 5 or 10% blockage here, right? Most of the blood still goes where it wants to go, no issues. However, whatever has caused this, in other words, what we do, what we don't do, how we treat ourselves, maybe some genetic factors, will probably continue. So, starts to build up a little bit more. What is known as angina will, may occur. This is when we have some type of heart pain. People feel this all the time, even relatively young. It's more common certainly in late 40s, 50, 60, 70 years old. And what may happen is what's known as a heart attack. Let me explain exactly what that is. Envision the blockage being right here, right? So let me just go to the arrow. Okay, so the blockage is going to occur about right here. Now, what that means is that the rest of the heart, where this is branching to, is not being fed enough oxygen. It's not being fed enough nutrients, right? That's why there's blockage, right? You guys can already see this is an issue. So if that part of the heart is not getting sufficient amount of blood supply, that means it's not going to be able to beat to send blood to the rest of the body. And what will happen is that part of the heart will actually die. And it becomes discolored. And this is why, if you've ever read anything about this, when surgeons go in and they look at somebody's heart, they can even predict or they can even determine that that individual has had a heart attack. They're, they're, and often the doctor or the viewer of the movie or the show or if it's in real life, they just go, how on earth did you know that? It's because that part of the heart becomes discolored. It's like dead flesh. It's like a brown color rather than like a pink color. It just doesn't look alive. And of course, if it happens down here, for instance, it only kills that part of the heart. We continue on. But if the coronary artery that's bigger and that feeds a bigger part of it, in other words, it's a bigger branch of this, then it causes a bigger problem. So let's move on. The worst part and the worst stage, of course, is when it becomes completely obstructed or mostly obstructed. A heart attack is imminent at this point. There's no blood flow to that part of the heart. A heart attack is imminent. And depending on where it happens in the heart, death may occur. Now I know you're like, oh man, doc, it's one thing to get us up at eight o'clock in the morning. It's another thing to talk about death at eight o'clock in the morning. But again, this is all matters to you. So many times when people, if, we, if you guys were just walk out of here right now or kind of cut out mentally here, you would go, this has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with you. Now, before we continue on with this whole thing, 
going to show you guys a little video just to kind of like expand on this a little bit. It's only like a minute or so long, but it's animation and you're going to see. Now I'm going to put a name to this. This progressive disease, this progression of plaque building up and hardening and keeping blood flowing from where it should go is what's known as arteriosclerosis. Big word, but if we break it down, you're going to go, I got it. Arteriosclerosis. Artero simply refers to the vessel that we've been talking about, the artery. These little guys outside the heart. Sclerosis means hardening, to become hard. If you guys have been paying attention up until this point, you should be going, this makes perfect sense. Why? I said that cholesterol, this plaque stuff that builds up is hardened cholesterol. And it literally becomes hard. In other words, if you were to go in and touch these arterial vessels, these coronary arteries, if you were to touch them and they're wide open like this, they'd be soft, they'd be pliable. Blood would be able to easily flow through them. But if this starts to build up and you were to touch it, it would feel hard. Hence the name. Hardening of the arteries or arteriosclerosis. This is also known as coronary heart disease or simply CHD. Now I mentioned an animation. In case there's some fogginess, it's not quite clear. Let me go to this video and help clarify things even more. The heart's beating. Now, of course, there's red blood cells. There's white blood cells. This is cholesterol. They call it fat. And it kind of goes below that first layer there. And this is what our bloodstream looks like, right? There's red blood cells, white blood, there's vitamins, minerals, and so forth. And then the plaque starts to build up. And you can see this is around 50% blockage. Of course, that's fairly quick. This happens over a period of years, maybe even decades. But to put a little more perspective on it, let me show you like years of progression. These are some possibilities of this happening. Bear with me here. This is age 30. This is age 50. This is age 70. This is age 90. That's one scenario. This is age 20. This is age 30. This is 35. This is 40. This is age 10. This is age 13, just for effect, I'm gonna go back just in case you guys didn't catch that. This is age 10, this is age 13, this could be 25, this could be 30. This has been known to occur in these coronary arteries in children as young as 12 and 13 years old. This is probably happening to a small percentage of the people sitting in this room. It's just by statistics, right, by percentage. It's probably occurring. Now, is it this or this? Probably not. Has, enough time hasn't occurred. This is probably occurring in a small percentage of people sitting in this room, all around campus. That's why we're having this discussion. We tend to think, ah, old man or old lady disease. It's not at all. In fact, this starts to happen at a really early age. Now, one of the things that people ask, in fact, it's quite possible you're thinking of this. You're like, holy smokes, this is pretty serious stuff, especially since this isn't a small percentage of the people who die in this country, right? This is a large percentage of the people who die in this country. And you might be thinking, holy cow, if this is happening, can this be reversed? That's the good news. Not only through medicine and surgery, it can be reversed naturally. And you guys can probably figure out at least some of those factors. What would cause this to reverse? But before we do that, Next week, we're going to end this whole conversation on a good note and talk about how we can reverse CHD. How can we reverse this plaque building up in the arterial wall? But what we're going to do today, at least start today, is to talk about the factors. What are the 
reasons why this starts to occur. Now, while I'm erasing the board, here's what I want you to do in your group of two or three. I want you guys write this down. What are the factors that causes this? And the hints are the following. I'm just going to give you guys two or three minutes to come up with a small list. What are the factors that cause this? And the hints for these responses are the following. It's what we do. Go ahead and write this down. What we don't do or who we are. What we do, what we don't do, or who we are. Go ahead, talk about it at your small table. Try to come up with as many as you can. By the way, there, it exceeds 15, the factors, and virtually every one of them you guys have heard of. Even if you don't think of it, when I talk about it, you're going to go, okay, that makes sense, especially after I explain why. So go ahead and chat about this. You have two or three minutes to come up with as many reasons, what we do, what we don't do, and who we are. Go. <laughs> Start talking about these factors or what are more formally known as risk factors. Now here's my suggestion. Because this is a continuing discussion into next week, after we name the, the risk factor, skip maybe three or four lines in your notes and then either at the end of this period or next week we'll come back and we'll explain why each leads to this, either directly or indirectly. So three or four lines in between each of these factors. Who's real confident that they have a couple of these factors nailed? What we do, what we don't do, or simply who we are. Who's co Mariah, you confident on that? What, what, name one of the ones that you guys have that you think belongs on this list. Unhealthy diet. Okay, let's extend this a little bit. What it directly has to do with is the amount of blood cholesterol. That makes perfect sense, right? If cholesterol is high in your bloodstream, this occurring, this buildup of plaque on the arterial wall is far more likely to happen. Now we know that an unhealthy diet is a vague term, but in particular, it's a high amount of what we refer to as saturated fat. Who remembers some of the foods that would be in the saturated fat category? By the way, what was the main characteristic we said about saturated fat? At room temperature, it is solid. And so therefore, yeah, butter is a good example. Anybody else remember what the number one food? Yeah, not just meat, but meat fat, right? The fat that we find in meat. And bacon is a really good example, right? It's a perfect example. But even if you look at a steak, uh, 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 some sausage, a piece of pork, before you cook it, it's really clear, right? The, the meat is either red or it's white, and sometimes it's marbled in there. And then we see that, in other words, animal fat is a really good source of this. And there's a direct correlation. The more animal fat that we eat, and you guys probably know that when it comes to, if we had the choice between, say, a steak or a piece of chicken, even though they're both animal meat, right, we know that the chicken has less of the saturated fat marbled in there. In fact, you can even see it before you cook it. That makes sense. But yeah, that's a good one. And most of the time, classes come up with that one first. It just makes sense. Yep, unhealthy diet is a really big factor here. Blood cholesterol. Anybody else? What's another one? Yeah. Genes. Genetics. It's hereditary. This is one of the unfortunate things about this. There's sometimes people, man, they, they eat salads. They, they, there's no soda in their diet. There's no dessert. Uh, every time they choose between meat, they choose chicken and turkey over pork and over, and sometimes, boom, this happens at a relatively early age on top of even just getting this. And then there's other people, they smoke, they drink Burger King every day, they're like, this is the best life ever, right? And then they're 80, 90 years old and they're running marathons. You're like, what the heck? But the fact is, is there's a, 
there's a direct correlation. There's not a perfect correlation, but there's a really strong correlation in how we treat ourselves and whether we get this or not. But genes do play a role. So we'll chat about that as well. Anything else would you guys come up with? Meredith? Age, very good. Meredith and, and Abby, they figured this out. They're like, well, he even said that the older you are, the more likely this is to happen. And we know that. In other words, if you were to take a group of, say, 70-year-olds and then compare them to a group of 40-year-olds and compare them to a group of, say, 25-year-olds, you would see a correlation. In other words, the highest percentage of people that have some blockage would probably be in the 70-year-old group. The next highest, 40, and so forth. You guys get that. How about this side of the room? Anybody over here? Yes. Very good. Lack of exercise. Physical inactivity is what we'll refer to this as. Yep, a big deal. In fact, as you guys can probably imagine, how many people are going to fall out of the seat when I say this? This is one of the ways to reverse it, right? If we are physically active, it's a great way to, in fact, it just makes sense. This cholesterol is a form of fat. Fat is a form of energy. We need more energy when we exercise than we're at rest, it's one of the great ways to reverse it. Okay, how about somebody else? Would you guys come up in the back? Carter and Zach. Smoking. Very good. Why would you say smoking, Carter? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> I did mention it? <laughs> so you guys didn't get it on your list until I, I mentioned it? Okay, that's very <laughs> good perception. <laughs> that's right, smoking is a factor. Okay. Uh, other factors would you guys come up with any other one that's not up here no okay somebody help these guys out I, I think you guys had a decent list Austin and Shannon we said fatty foods fast foods no exercise sedentary then Asian smoking Asian smoking okay you guys a lot of the good ones drinking this is a we're gonna put this over here and I'll explain that next week but alcohol is a factor. It's strange though because moderate amounts can actually help reverse it. That's what's interesting. But large amounts can actually increase the chances. So one more reason to be moderate in things like that. Anybody else have any other factor that, that on your sheet that it's not up here? Kathleen, you look like you have at least something written down. Yeah. Why would you say gender, Catherine? Between the two Males and females, who do you think is more likely? Males, yeah. Most people guess that, but guess who's a close second? <laughs> All right. Anybody, uh, any other factor you guys want to guess at? Who haven't we heard from? Dakota. Have you ever heard from you guys? Is there anything you guys have? Okay. Anybody else have anything else? All right. Let's name a couple more. This actually can exceed uh, 15. Let's talk about uh, maybe nine or ten of them. All right. Diabetes. Race. Overfatness or being actually obese. Did you guys come up with that one? No? Okay. Let's end with this one. This is another one that we can't quite, I don't think we mentioned this one. Although Michael Jackson tried, we can't change this one. Oh, race. Oh, sorry. What was I? Race. Um, there was four. Do we have the four that you can't? Let's see. Heredity, age, gender, race, and I guess I'm, yeah. Well, let's just stop at the, the magic now. I'll keep you guys guessing. You guys can look that up this week. What's the tenth one? What's that? Location. Location. We're like where you live in the country, yeah, you mean? Oh, interesting. That's, that's decent insight. I, I, there might be a correlation between that as far as minerals go, but I have never read anything that has directly to do with the minerals in the diet. But we certainly know that diet has something to do with that. And that actually comes into play with race because certain parts of the country, so forth. We'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We'll end this conversation with talking about um, what are called lipoproteins, and this directly goes into this discussion here, and then we'll stop. So just give me a couple more minutes, and then we'll talk about this so we can relate back to this next week.
Okay. This is one of the truly amazing things about the human body. There's a lot of amazing things. This definitely is right up there. Our liver makes what are called lipoproteins. They're just what they say. Lipo refers to fat. Protein means it's made of amino acids. It's a protein. And these are special lipid proteins that are made by the liver. There's two primary types that are made by the liver. One of them is called high-density lipoproteins, or they're often known by the three-letter acronym, high-density lipoproteins, or HDLs. These guys literally are released from the liver and they'll go through the, and they, they just check things out. And their only job is to check the arterial wall for plaque. And they go by and they go, okay, this is all clear, this is all clear. They don't really talk like this, but this is what they do, right? You guys get the idea. Yeah, this is good. Okay, yeah, there's none around here. And they just keep cruising through the arterial wall. They go, oh, some plaque. And they actually help remove it. And because it's a form of energy, it'll take it to the cell to be used as energy, or it'll take it back to the liver and go, you stay right here. This way you can't cause any havoc in the human body, right? Takes it back to the liver. Needless to say, these guys are what are called the good cholesterol. They're not actually cholesterol at all. They just deal with it in a positive way. And I'll bet there's a few of you guys have heard that term. I gotta raise my good cholesterol. I gotta lower my bad cholesterols. In fact, when you go get blood work done and your cholesterol is actually checked, this is one of the things they determine. And they're like, you have your cholesterol numbers here, but your high cholesterols are really high. Or they'll say they're really low, you need to boost those. Now. There's also what's known as low-density lipoproteins, or LDLs. And these guys, they do the same thing. They kind of travel through the bloodstream, and, but they look for cholesterol that is not yet adhered to arterial wall, and they like to go from this to this. Needless to say, these guys are bad cholesterol. They actually add to the problem. Now the fact is, is we all have HDLs and LDLs in our bloodstream. What we want to do is we want to do the right things, not do other things, to make sure that our HDLs are at their maximum and the LDLs are at their lowest possible level. So a recap. These guys come out, they come out and their teeth are crooked and their hair is all messed up and they're like, ha! I'm going to go create havoc in the arterial wall. And they grab cholesterol and they put it against the wall. And they go, you're going to become plaque. And they make sure it stays there. And it goes, ha, ha, I've got it. Right? Talks to kind of a nasty voice. And then there's HDLs. And they hop out of liver. They have a cape on and a mask. And they hide there. And they cruise through there. And they go, aha, there's cholesterol buildup here. I'm going to reverse this process. There's a villain in the area. Right? And then they just reverse it. They chip away at it. They have a little hammer and chisel. They go, no, you need to get away from there. In other words, it tries to send this process this way. Now these factors that we just talked about, these nine, or if we count race twice, ten, these guys are directly related or indirectly related to every one of those factors, or just about every one of those factors. A lot of stuff, a lot of new information, but you guys can grasp it, especially with the help of some uh, photos and some animation. Good stuff. I'll see you guys next time. Dr. John Aquaviva, Associate Professor in the Wingate University School of Sports Sciences, speaking on the subject of coronary heart disease. In this episode, Dr. Aquaviva examined the risk factors. However, there's a silver lining. You can turn back the clock. On the next Wingate Lecture Series, Dr. Aquaviva will tell us how we can reverse coronary heart disease. That's next time. We hope you'll join us. I'm Dr. Martha Asti. Thank you for watching.